Hello, everyone. We are live now. Um, thanks for joining this uh, Weber C Hacks interview today. So uh, I, I've been we've been talking about web codex uh, and, and web transport for a couple of years now as a kind of the next wave or next thing coming to WebRTC to give lower level more controls, allow you to do more things. But it's been a couple of years um, and I'm not aware of anyone that has a production service uh, that's using these technologies. But uh, there's been a lot of really interesting demos, which we'll walk through today that, that kind of show that we're getting close. So um, I, I actually reached out to Bernard uh, to understand what was the latest in the standards. Um, and you know, maybe with that, I'll, I'll do some introductions. So I've, I first met Bernard, I, I think it was back in 2011 uh, at one of the you know, WebRC working, early WebRC working groups. So I think it was over at Acme Packet uh, for quite a while. I've, I've interviewed him a few times uh, for WebRC Hacks. You can see some of it there. Bernard's a, he's a principal architect uh, at Microsoft and Skype. He's been a longtime co-chair of the W3C uh, working group for WebRTC. Um, he's also... Um, uh, you know, a, a co-chair uh, uh, more recently of the IETF uh, web trans and AVT tour groups. Uh, so heavily involved in the standards. Francois is another, uh, you know, uh, another gentleman I, uh, I met more recently. Um, he is a uh, web and TV specialist over at w W3C. He recently did a number of, a couple of excellent posts uh, for WebRC hacks uh, on real-time video processing, web codecs, and streams uh, based on some research he and his colleague Dominique uh, have been working on to see how those APIs tie together. And uh, joining us hopefully in a couple minutes, we'll also have uh, Jordi um, Sanzano Ferret from, um, from Meta. He's a video software engineer here. Uh, he's been experimenting as part of some of the IETF Media Over Quick group. Uh, and actually a few people suggested that I get him to write a post or do something about the, this really great uh, ultra low latency kind of real time streaming and playback demo he's put together. And uh, I like to actually thank Bernard, I, you know, in reaching out to Bernard to do, um, you know, see if he'd be interested in doing an update on standards. He actually suggested pulling together a panel here uh, to talk through some of these recent experiments and to go into this a little more detail. So um, here we are today. So, uh, Let's dive into the questions. I'm going to try to keep this to about 30 minutes, and then we can open it up to audience Q and A. Um, I was just you know telling the panelists here I can easily keep them for for three hours, but uh, we uh, we're, we're on somewhat tight timeline, so uh, let's get going. I'd like to start out with, I guess, talking a little bit about like what's what's wrong with WebRTC. Like why why do we need these new approaches in the first place? Why are we you know what are we putting all this effort, or why are you putting all this effort into uh, these new techniques and these new approaches, um, you know, what is it that we can't do with WebRC today that you're trying to accomplish and, and who is this for? And uh, maybe the, you know, start, I'll have you, uh, I'll have you go, Bernard. Okay. I guess the first thing to say, Chad, is that a lot of the ideas in this effort started by extending WebRTC. So for example, insertable streams, or what we call encoder transform or breakout box, what we call media capture transform, both are streams-based APIs. So that was the first introduction of WD streams into WebRTC. And those ideas uh, have been picked up in web transport. So in my view, a lot of it is extending WebRTC, uh, but also adding new capabilities where you can combine WebRTC with other things. So as an example, I think you've done some excellent uh, articles in WebRTC hacks about using insertable streams, uh, using breakout box to do stuff. And these are more tools that you have in your toolbox. Uh, for example, you can combine web codecs with WebRTC, maybe to add support for a new codec. I've seen some interesting experiments, for example, uh, now that we have HEVC decode in web codecs, maybe combining that with WebRTC. Uh, and so I wouldn't say it's an either or. Uh, but one area I think Jordy will speak to in particular is the yeah, is yeah. low latency so, streaming. Speaking of Jordy, hi Jordy. <laughs> yeah. So that's an area. There are some things that uh, I would claim that WebRTC is not great at, such as uh, ultra low latency streaming uh, that can be done with web codecs and web transport. And we'll certainly get into that. Um, but just, just to clarify, uh, Chad, the reason, one of the reasons WebRTC is not great at that is you can use the data channel to send CMAF, for example, in low latency streaming, but quick is a better transport. 
um, and that's what you get with with web transport. Okay. Although it does it, and also at least at the moment, data channel doesn't function in workers. We have a spec for it; it's not implemented. Yeah. Web transport, you get the full worker. All right. Uh, maybe uh, quickly, and, and just a, I, I did give you a brief introduction, Jordy. Um, but maybe it's a good part. I, I asked kind of, you know, what are we trying to accomplish here? What are we trying to do that we can't do before? Maybe this is a good spot for you to kind of just give a overview of your kind of recent demo uh, and what you were trying to achieve there that you, you couldn't do with, uh, I guess, uh, existing tech or technologies like WebRTC alone. Uh, yeah, uh, so thank you. And first of all, apologize for the, for the delay. But yeah, so I wouldn't say that, uh, that the demo is to do something that we couldn't do before. Uh, I think that the MOQ will give us that, hopefully. But the demo was just to, uh, to test uh, those, uh, those MOQ ideas. So basically, the, web, the usage of Quick, or Web Transport, in this case, my demo is Web Transport, and, uh, and basically to test if those ideas were, were working. And yeah, definitely the, the demo. I don't know if you, if you want me to, to enter into the architectural details of the demo or just uh, uh, an overview. Yeah, actually, I mean, now is probably a good time to transition into the architecture bit and, and maybe give a little bit of background here for people who uh, haven't uh, haven't seen that. I'm, I'll I'll actually post the I, I, in the kind of WebRC introduction. Uh, I did a post on WebRC hacks with introducing uh, this topic and with a bunch of links. I'll I'll post that in a second. But why don't you go ahead and uh, and 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 show your uh, if you want, you can share yeah. your uh, share your screen. Actually, I think I might already have. I, I, I can I can share I can share my okay. screen. Okay, yeah. Why don't you go ahead and share your screen? I'll put it up. Yes. Uh, let me just share the entire. Uh, well, one second. I am going to share just the window. Uh, we'll go up. Okay. Uh, sorry. Okay. Share screen now. Okay. Anyway. Okay. I'm gonna share the, the entire screen. So sorry. Okay. Uh, I, I guess now you are seeing the the block diagram, isn't it? Uh. Yep. Let me get the screen right. I can make it a little bit bigger here. Okay. Okay, so basically, this is the, the demo they, uh, that I implemented. Again, the only purpose was to learn and also to, uh, to try to demonstrate that those, those ideas that we were talking in the MOQ workgroup were possible and were working. So basically, what I, what I implemented is just a JavaScript uh, application that, does, uh, that leverages web codecs and web transport and captures, the, captures the, the data from the camera and the microphone and sends, sends it, uh, it uh, com compresses video and audio data and sends every video and audio frame in a different quick stream. So quick streams are reliable, uh, but uh, so basically all the data in that frame is uh, guaranteed to arrive to the, to the relay. Then one of the most interesting features of MOQ is that it's cacheable. So, or that we plan, uh, we plan for it to be cacheable. So basically what I implemented is leveraging QuickGo and uh, web transfer implementation from Adrian Cable on top of QuickGo. I implemented a cache, uh, a, CDN, a CDN node that caches uh, all of those objects that the encoder sends. And on the other side, uh, again, JavaScript application leveraging uh, web codecs uh, too, I implemented a player that just uh, uh, that receives that information from the relay uh, because MOQ is push based from the relay to the to the player and uh, receives that information and decodes it and, and renders it into a canvas and a, an audio context. So going a little bit into into the detail and I uh, I will just uh, describe this very briefly. This is the block diagram of the application. So the application it's not optimized for production at all. So I would say it's quite the opposite but it's optimized for experimentation. So that's why I tried to keep the, to do a very clear separation of concerns that allowed me to move very fast in, the, in this testing. But definitely uh, for performance, this is not the architecture that you want, I think. Uh, so, okay, uh, starting from the, from the top, 
So we have the video, ca video capture, so get user media, we capture audio, we capture video, so uh, pixels and PCM samples. Uh, we do some adjustment here because we want audio and video to be in sync and the timestamps of those uh, two pipelines are absolutely uh, different. So basically we, we align them, just a, just a subtraction here. And then we, uh, we recommend that information with some wall clock uh, timing and when that sample was captured. That it's very handy uh, when, you are in the, uh, when you are in the player and you, wa you want to do rewinds or highlights of that content. Then we send it to a web codex. So uh, you can see that this uh, runs into web workers. And the encoder H264 and Opus for video and for audio. We set keyframes and et cetera. Uh, uh, and, and then finally, we, uh, we created a packager uh, for, for, this, uh, for this demo. It's not, the purpose is not to standardize any packager at all. Uh, it was just easy to create my own packager that to import uh, libraries uh, fragmented MP4 or, um, or, FL, or FLB. I, I wouldn't mention it. Fragmented MP4 will be probably the one that uh, MOGO will use. And finally, inside the web worker, it opens a web transport session and it sends the, it sends the streams uh, to, the, to the relay. Important to mention here that send order is not, or at least it was not available yet in the browser when I implemented this demo. So this demo is all without send order. Okay, the relay, uh, the relay is quite simple. So basically it receives uh, with this uh, URL web, uh, this is the web transport session. So that URL, that entry point, and that uh, stream ID, uh, stream identifier. And then uh, we, we receive those objects and we save those objects in memory for some TTL that is indicated from the, from the encoder. The player, so th this is typical, typical CDN, or until now it's a typical CDN behavior. The player just open a session to uh, this entry point, MOQ delivery, obviously same stream ID, this is the stream identifier, and some parameters that are, uh, uh, that are used for, re for rewind and also to inform the, the relay of the jitter buffers uh, to allow the relay to, do, uh, to make better decisions. And then what is the cache key? So we are talking about CDNs or relays, so it's important to know what is the cache key. So the cache key is obviously the stream ID that we get it from the web transport session. And then the, the, the video track, in this case, we only have video and audio, but it could be video one, video two, video three, that comes from the object header and, uh, and the sequence ID that comes from the object header. That is basically the number of the objects or the number of the video frame and the number of the audio frame. So that uh, creates a unique identifier per every object, in this case, per every frame. So this implementation is uh, frame per uh, object per frame, but MOQ is flexible enough to, uh, you, if you want to put a go per frame, you can. So basically it's, it gives you just a description that what is a group, what is an object, and then you can put whatever you want. In this case, again, it's frame per object. Okay, stream ID and from object header. And finally, uh, and this is my last one, sorry, I'm taking a lot of time, uh, the player. So player open a web transport session against the CDN no, or the relay. And again, with, with the stream ID, with the URL that, that we saw, this one that identifies the stream and starts receiving, and remember, the URL pushes the data to, uh, to the player. The player starts receiving audio and video frames then uh, it knows because of the object header, if it's video or audio, it sends each one to the right pipeline. We have a digital buffer because uh, re uh, remember that the quick stream is guaranteed, is guaranteed, so it's reliable, but there is no guarantee that the, uh, the, if you push different quick streams to the network, the order is not guaranteed. And then we need some de jitter, so to make sure that the, that the decoder sees the frames, the video frames in order and the audio decoder uh, the same. So we, have so, we do some timestamp uh, compensation in the audio. This is, a, this is a whole subject by itself, so I'm just going to, uh, to tell a couple of sentences. So, it's a, so basically what it took, what it took uh, what, the subject I spent more time in this, uh, in this uh, proof of concept is in the audio and video timestamp uh, alignment. So uh, it's something that could be very, very improved. But anyway, uh, here we do some compensation to basically audio and video align. And uh, sorry, I, I think I, I jumped. Here. Okay. No, so yeah, I, 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 I guess uh, maybe we just do, stick to the art, kind of the overview now. Uh, 
I, I do want to dig into some of the challenges and you know oh, okay uh, no, the, perfect, the perfect. problems you ran into how you overcame them and you know what that means going forward too so we'll, we'll, we'll get to that in a yeah, yeah. And, uh, sorry last point send audio to an audio circular buffer so basically it's a it's a, it's a share memory that between audio work like uh, processors and the main thread and then uh, it's uh, how i'm sending the audio samples and finally uh, we put the video pixels into into a video buffer and we render align them with audio that's it so okay. sorry it, it took a lot of time thank you <laughs> sorry um Maybe now, uh, as a good architectural overview, uh, I, I think it might be helpful to, to dig into the, maybe let's take a look at streams um, and, and I guess where that fits with breakout, you know, box and media capture transform. Um, Francois, I think you had some materials there. Um, you, you covered that quite a bit in the WebC Hacks post, but I'll, let me give you a couple minutes. You can, you can walk through those bits and then we can talk through, uh, I guess, Putting all the you know how all these things come together and some of the challenges of a uh, of the combined architecture. Yes, sure. I can. Uh, so streams are a generic uh, purpose mechanism to manage streams. The the name is uh, was uh, rightly chosen. Uh, so the good things about the good things about streams uh, are that uh, it uh, uh, it deals it takes care of uh, queuing. Uh, in the different steps, so you're going to end up with a with a pipeline that uh, you know different steps, and these steps are going to be connected through streams, typically through transform streams, and uh, streams takes care of the queuing mechanism. If uh, your transform takes a bit of time, then the the queue uh, is going to be managed by the streams uh, protocol itself, that streams API itself, uh, and it. Uh, and, uh, includes uh, uh, more importantly, even more importantly than queuing, it includes uh, a back pressure mechanism. Uh, so that means that, uh, well, again, if you have something that takes a bit longer to process, uh, you can send a, uh, the, the streams will send a, a, a back pressure signal uh, to the uh, nodes uh, that are upstreams, and uh, they will be basically stop producing uh, new chunks of uh, of data. So that's that makes it a fantastic uh, uh, in, in on paper a fantastic uh, uh, API to use when dealing with uh, audio and video because they are in a sense stream. Um, so one of the reasons uh, I'm, I'm uh, before I uh, so I'm, I'm, my part I, I've been more looking into uh, actually video processing on the client because one of the uh, as answer to your first question on top of uh, uh, improvement to transport issues which uh, Jordi and uh, and Bernard have been talking about we're seeing more and more use cases that need. Uh, processing that have processing needs in real time. So meaning they need to change the contents of the video frame in real time. And that means they need to have access to the pixels themselves. And that's one of the reasons why we're looking into extending uh, WebRTC and extending uh, the way that uh, providing new mechanisms to web applications so that they can uh, manipulate uh, these uh, uh, these frames. Uh, and that's done in WebCodex. We mentioned that already, which exposes the video frame uh, interface in particular. And then you have a connection with WebRTC through the media stream track insertable media processing using streams specification that provides video track generator and media stream track process. And so, in the end, what you what you end up with is a is a set of dominoes that you can use and you can assemble any way you you wish on the client to uh, to manipulate uh, these streams. And we've already seen uh, uh, examples with Jordi. I've been uh, uh, the, uh, the diagram follows this as well. So if you if you if you're taking from the, the camera, you get get user media, and then you, the, the what's important here is uh, essentially the end uh, the, what you get out of it. And get user media gives you a media stream track, but with a media stream track, you cannot process this. You cannot process the video frame directly. You need something else. You need to turn it into an actual stream because get user media doesn't. Uh, rely doesn't use uh, streams by default, so you're going to feed it to a, a media stream track processor, and that's going to give you the uh, the stream of video frame that you can then process in any way you wish. Uh, and web transport here is interesting because web transport is already based on streams, so you get you get the streams uh, in a way you you get the streams of video frames for free. You, if you send uh, video frames over web transport, you'll get the, you'll get them. Uh, uh, you receive a, a stream of video frame. Of course, you. 
video frames directly, raw video frames over web transport. You're going to send encoded video frames uh, over web transport for a, a bandwidth reason, but that uh, simplifies your, your pipeline. Uh, so I think that's a generic introduction on uh, on streams and where they fit in this uh, uh, in this uh, design architecture. Okay. Uh, well, maybe why we we have you uh, up here, Francois. You can talk a little bit. But where can you give us some highlights on uh, like what, what are some of the challenges that you discovered? What works? What didn't? Uh, if you take a couple minutes on that, and I'll, I'll ask Bernard and Jordy after that too. The same same question. So uh, sure. So again, uh, my experience my experiments were really about uh, processing on the client more than transport over the network, uh, and I was really uh, trying to assess. Okay, can, can we? What can we do with video frame in uh, in uh, in real time? Can we actually process them? Uh, how are the uh, performance there? Uh, what would be typical performance if I if I uh, process a frame with a JavaScript? If I process a frame with WebAssembly? If I process a frame with WebGPU or WebGL? Uh, what's what's going to happen? And uh, in order to do that, the first thing is that you you need to be able to measure performance and uh, measuring performances. Uh, processing steps is uh, is doable, but uh, end to end, it's 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 relatively hard. Uh, in particular, because from a rendering perspective, you cannot follow a video frame and up until it uh, it gets rendered on screen. Uh, the workaround uh, I used is that I'm, uh, I'm essentially encoding the timestamp of the video frame uh, uh, as an overlay uh, on top of the. Uh, actual video uh, frame, and uh, I'm using a request video frame callback to uh, uh, get uh, uh, to get that uh, that video frame back, and then to understand when it's going to be rendered, and to extract the, the encoded uh, timestamp from it, so that I can more or less track this. But that's absolutely not perfect. And request video frame callback, uh, there's no guarantee that you'll get all the frames. You can miss some of them because it runs on the on the main thread and it can miss uh, some of the frames. Uh, also, it's not clear to me that I've managed to actually measure correctly um, web GPU uh, performances in the sense that I'm, it's really not clear. With web GPU, you throw some, uh, some job to uh, the GPU and what you get in the end is canvas content, but this, you, you don't really know when the canvas content is updated. You just know that when you're going to use it, um, uh, the, the the browser will synchronize, so will uh, will wait until uh, until the, the job is done. Uh, but uh, I'm not exactly sure that when I feed that to a video frame, I'm actually measuring the uh, uh, the, the. I mean, the, it, it, it may be that uh, uh, browsers actually uh, don't uh, wait until the, the job is done right there. Um, another uh, problem I uh, bumped into is that uh, actually uh, uh, Jordi mentioned uh, sending video frame uh, to another workers. That there's a, a bit of a problem when you when you have a stream of a video frame is that across workers, a stream is transferable and that's fantastic. Uh, but uh, the chunks themselves that are within uh, uh, um, a stream are not transferred; they are serialized. And uh, the problem with serialization is it's not it doesn't really duplicate the actual row, row pixels, and that's good. But uh, it requires the sender to call videoframe.close because video frames need to be explicitly closed. They have a, a, a life cycle like this. And uh, that cannot be done easily. And you need, uh, because you don't know when the uh, sending is actually done, when the transfer has, a, has, has taken place, because there's no way in the streams API that uh, there's no no place where this gets done, uh, and uh, th there's an ongoing proposal, and uh, I'm I'm glad that this uh, experiment uh, uh, at least prompted some people to uh, uh, to progress on that on that front mm -hmm. uh, to uh, extend uh, streams and allow to transfer chunks as well uh, on top of um, uh, serializing them. Uh, and uh, time flies, and time flies probably on this presentation as well. Uh, it, it's uh, it's really uh, hard to keep the processing window that you have and to make sure that everything's going to work, especially because there are lots of things that happens under the hood. So uh, there, there's some measurements there on this slide uh, in terms of, of course, it's it's more more performant to process a video frame with WebGPU because it's highly parallelized by definition. 
but the problem is that you, you need to reason about memory copies in order to do that. And video frames are extremely large, raw pixels, I mean, raw video frames are extremely large. And so memory copies take time. And it's really hard to reason about memory copies in practice. Uh, there are various memory boundaries that exist physically or not. I mean, they can be uh, due to the, the way the, uh, uh, the browser is architected, has been architected. Um, and uh, it's not clear whether a browser is going to use a hardware-based encoder or decoder or a software-based uh, decoder, for instance. Uh, it, even if they use an uh, uh, hardware-based uh, decoder, you don't really know if it's uh, GPU-bound in terms of memory or if it's CPU-bound. Uh, and so you, there are also memory comes in variety of form, then there are some caching involved. And of course, buffers, copying a buffer that is hot in cache uh, is extremely fast. Co co copying a, a buffer that is not in cache takes much longer. And it's really hard to understand when buffers are going to be in, a, uh, in a, 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 um, are going to be copied or not. So it is an example of a, well, the different interfaces that you, a way to imagine to it's wrong. I mean, there are many more, but uh, uh, a way to imagine the browser and the, and the memory. Um, and an example here of uh, something where you could imagine a, a process that is optimized, and in the end, it doesn't really, it, it, it isn't really optimized in the end. So on the left side, uh, I'm just doing some uh, encoding and decoding. The first operation actually copies the frame, to the video frame to the GPU. And then I'm hoping that actually encode, the encoding step will just uh, use, actually uses WebAssembly to do a, a little uh, processing on the video frame. That's not pretty fast, but because WebAssembly is a bit slow, that's normal. But then you realize that the encoding step, which is exactly the same in practice, in theory, uh, takes much less uh, when uh, I'm on the right on the right side, then on the left side, and that probably means that in this case the browser decided to use a, a software-based uh, uh, encoder, or at least one that is CPU bound in terms of memory, and uh, and so it makes it really hard to reason about uh, how to optimize things. I think that's it. Okay, um, that was great. I love that. Me, uh, Bernard, uh, I'll, I'll pass it to you to make the same kind of comments on your. Your experiments um, that, yeah. that you did, I mean, I think you were some of the first to do some of these experiments, uh, kind of what, what's working, what's not. I mean, I'm, I'm, you yeah. showed me some of your so, performance numbers. Um, I'm especially interested in that. Yeah, so let me uh, clarify, Chet. Uh, there are some commercial products using web codecs now, but not web transport as far as I'm aware. So uh, in my experiments, I focused on AV1 because I, I wanted to understand how far along it was. And I can show you... Uh, yeah, uh, your, uh, an example uh, of the runs that I did there. Um, I don't know if can you see. Ah, yeah, good. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so this is an example with AV1 running at full HD, uh, 30 frames a second, which I, I thought would be extremely challenging, but it actually did work on both encode and decode. Um, and it pretty much worked on all the hardware I tried at Mac, uh, a bunch of Windows machines. Um, and what the big question there was understanding the performance. What I actually did um, part of it as I was interested in transport. So I used uh, uh, SVC um, in order to, with temporal uh, SVC so mm -hmm. that not all frames were required to be transmitted. And as Francois mentioned, you have a very, very small uh, time window there where you have to get things through. So you can't wait too long on transmission. So I implemented partial reliability on top of the frame per stream uh, transport and web transport. Um, and then I would essentially, for the, not, for the discardable frames, the ones at the higher uh, temporal layers, would give up uh, if it exceeded that limit. Um, so you can see, uh, in general, you had fairly tight frame RTTs. Um, with the exception of the iframes, which took considerably longer. And the reason for that I discovered was that the congestion window in Quick, when you start off the iframe, it's, it's too small to send the iframe in a single um, round trip. So it takes multiple round trips. So there's this weird interaction of the congestion window and the iframe. The other thing I found is I used RBFC, as Francois mentioned, to try to get the glass to glass latency. In an RBFC, I think that's represented by presentation time minus capture time. 
um, using the media time as the unique identifier, as, as Francois said. But you can see there's some weird things here. First of all, um, in that in the right hand diagram, um, it looks like there's there's a spike, a uh, fairly regular spike going on. In addition, RBFC isn't guaranteed to give you every frame. So I didn't yeah. get metadata on every frame. So anyway, um, there's something uh, I don't understand quite going on here. The uh, frame RTTs don't show those same spikes, or, or maybe they do actually, <laughs> uh, but, but not quite as bad. Um, so that's an interesting thing, but uh, at least AV1 in software did seem to be usable uh, for both encode and decode, which surprised me. I didn't, I didn't expect that to happen. Um, uh, the, so uh, I guess one of the things to follow up is to understand where some of these spikes are occurring in the, in the system where there's uh, queuing going on in, in the WD streams. Um, the other thing I would mention is uh, probably want to show you just a few things uh, about the uh, standard status and uh, where we are. Um, so yeah, well, in terms we, of the, we could do that yeah. in the, uh, I, I was going to close out okay. with uh, some of that. I, I mean, we can cover it now if you think it's relevant, but uh, I, I want to close yeah, out, I just, guess. Uh, kind of, what, what, what's next or where we go from here? But, but well, uh, I, I, well, I think, I, yeah. Um, all right, well, if, you're, if you're getting holding that thought, um, maybe I'll let okay. uh, J Jordy talk a little bit uh, uh, you know, kind of what were his conclusions uh, from his experiments on what, what what was he happy with? What wasn't he happy with? Yeah. So, so uh, thanks. Uh, so m m by the way, uh, Bernard, I, 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 I wasn't expecting everyone to work in real time either. So congratulations. That is impressive. <laughs> and, and also the, I really like the Francois uh, explanation because I felt I felt that I was hitting uh, a lot of those uh, things that he was he was explaining. So I learned a lot from from his explanation. So and uh, and going to what didn't work or what uh, what was challenging in the uh, when I was implementing the demo, it was uh, uh, as I said uh, audio and video synchronization. So as as Francois mentioned, so uh, timestamps survives the decoding and encoding and decoding uh, video timestamps survives the encoding and decoding uh, stages but not audio timestamps. So, and then, then if you want to align video and audio, you will have, a, or I had <laughs> at least a hard time because you need, audio can be dropped, video too, but video since has a unique timestamp, that it's an easy problem. But audio, it's much more challenging. If it drops something, you need to, uh, to know exactly how, um, how much it dropped to compensate those timestamps and basically align them. So this is one of the main challenges that uh, I spend a, a lot of time. I think I more or less solve it, but uh, with a lot of hacks that I'm not happy with. I would love to for the audio timestamps to be the same as video timestamps. So basically, to be persistent across all the flow, and then everything will be much simpler, and I could remove half of my code. <laughs> so uh, that is that is the main thing. And then uh, then small things that also uh, complicated my life building that um, that um, POC. I realized that audio frame is not transferable, although audio data that is the, the decoded data is transferable. So, okay, that definitely the performance, it's a big, a big performance hit because audio, there is a lot of, there is not, it's not big, but there is a lot of frames. Uh, it's 21 milliseconds, uh, every frame. So uh, that's a lot of uh, copies. And what else, what else, what else? Oh yeah, and the, this is one, one small thing that definitely took me hours to figure out. That was six months ago, probably, so perhaps it's fixed. But when I was trying um, uh, uh, video decoding with the false, so basically that it uses hardware acceleration, nothing was working. So suddenly stopped working, everything, so everything went super slow, and I was just putting counters everywhere, and I finally changed hardware acceleration, so the false by preferred software, everything solved. So this is probably something related to what Francois was uh, talking about, doing behind the scenes, doing copies or not doing copies. So those are the, were the challenges. I don't know if, if I want to show you a couple of uh, uh, numbers of my experiments uh, now or... Uh, yeah, why don't, why don't we do that real... Do you have the, do you have it in your slides? Uh, you yes. Real quick. Uh, um, okay. I, I did uh, want to make sure we save some time for audience Q&A here, so... Uh... Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, but, uh, it, if, yeah, if, uh, let's, let's put it up in your show quick. Yes, so basically I did this demo last week uh, that now I'm in San Francisco, so I, I have a server uh, uh, relay in Oregon, 
I measure run through time, it's around 36 milliseconds. And then, uh, so not run through time, more or less, 36 milliseconds. And then I did the demo is, uh, with a live, live stream from San Francisco going back and forth to Oregon, S264, very uh, slow, slow, small resolution, 30 frames per second, Opus, uh, 500 kilobits per second video, Opus, uh, 32 kilobits per second. And the latency, end-to-end -end latency, glass-to-glass, -glass was with a very good experience, so no, uh, no drops, uh, very smooth, it was 140 milliseconds. So, and it was, a, I also measured the uh, uh, latency, but to be honest, I recognize it's not super accurate. Here is the, uh, uh, an automatic latency measure based on wall clock. Here it says 115, but uh, the real one, the glass to glass real, uh, you can see it's 140. And then uh, this was a very, a very easy one, but then I, I did this, uh, uh, okay. I added, uh, I increased the resolution and the bit rate, and then the latency was a bit higher, 380. And another one, so basically I did exactly the same experiment, but now the relay, I put it in Frankfurt, in Europe. That's a run trip time of uh, 167 milliseconds, more or less. And the latency, as you can imagine, with uh, 500 kilobits per second, increased real glass to glass to almost 700 milliseconds. And this is important to mention that this is without send order. So we are not prioritizing here. Uh, so this is also, this is, I would say this is the lowest bound, this is, uh, or the highest bound in this case later. Say. This is uh, from here, we can add mechanisms to improve it. All right, great, thanks. Um, Thank you. I, I, uh, maybe like I just, a more general question is, uh, it, it seems like we're close um, or like getting closer, right? But there's still a lot of pretty significant challenges here. Is it, I mean, it, do, do you all think it is more of opinion? Do you all think, I mean, you're continuing to work on this, but it, is it all going to work? Um, I mean, you, you keep doing this. Uh, is, do, you, do you see this coming together? So I, I we, we can talk about what it's going to take to to make it all come together in a moment too, right? But uh, it's a maturity process. I've heard a lot, a lot from developers very similar to what Jordy said, particularly the uh, availability of hardware acceleration, um, losing the hardware acceleration, and going to software. Um, so it's early days for web codecs, uh, and I think we're going to be mature. We're going to get more support, for example, for HEBC. Um, we're still working on a lot of the encoding parameters. So I, I'd say we're probably a, a year away from being more mature. Um, but so there are that set of things. Uh, and, and then there are the What WD Streams issues that Francois mentioned. I wouldn't say that What WD Streams was developed specifically for media processing. I, I hope that's accurate, Francois. So some of the things uh, that Francois is mentioning are only getting attention now. Uh, okay. Anything any to add to that, uh, Francois? No, no, that's correct. I mean, uh, one thing to add perhaps is that some of these stuff actually touch on different blocks being developed by different, uh, different sets of people. And yeah. so one of the difficulties is that it's everyone wants things to work, but at the same time, it's no one's priority in the sense that it's not in scope, in, in a, the specific scope of a, any specific group. So you have to have a coordination, uh, coordination, lots of collaboration and coordination work across groups, which takes time. Yeah, I think there are seven different W3C working groups uh, working on the APIs we've been talking about today. Right, because it's WebGPU, WebGL, Web Transport, Web Codex, WebRTC stuff. You know, it's a pretty yeah. big setup. All right. Well, maybe let's, let's, to to close out, we can talk a little bit more. Like, all right, what, what's next, or how do we get there, Bernard? Maybe I'll, I'll let you go back to your slides, I guess, to say where where we're at in the standards process and and what you're doing okay. to make this happen. Yeah. Um, so uh, maybe you could just show the slides that just enumerate all the all the different things we're talking about. Um, so it, uh, yeah, I think I got the third one up here. Yeah. You got your deck so um, yeah, uh, well, I think TPAC is coming up in W3C, Francois. So we should probably talk about how to herd the, the cats. Um, it's it's not easy to uh, you know a lot of these issues we're describing are between groups, but Web Codex is owned by the Media Working Group. Uh, Web Codex has shipped in Chrome. Um, it is being worked on in Safari uh, for video only, so we're, we're going to see that. Web Transport uh, is shipping in Chrome, and it is just recently shipped in Firefox. So in 1.14, you've got Web Transport. 
Um, and then a bunch of the other APIs are, are mostly in Chrome. I think, uh, uh, I guess, uh, breakout boxes in Chrome and searchable streams are in Chrome. Uh, there's a version of both of those, I think, in Safari. Um, but it is, and then there's the rendering APIs, uh, which are web GPU, I would still say is, is not mature, uh, but it, it's coming along. So, uh, and what WD streams, which is in another standards body entirely, right? Which is the what working group. Um, so definitely a lot of coordination challenges here. Um, and of course, WebAssembly is used for a lot of this. Um, but, um, you know, there's, there's developers like, like the folks on this call, um, and then there's all the working groups. And I'm not sure that, uh, as Francois said, a lot of cats to be herded. All right. Uh, I, I guess, uh, Francois, anything to, to add, I guess, on what you're seeing in uh, the W3C, I guess, to, to help bring all, all this together? I mean, other than yourself, I mean, is this uh, is someone driving kind of this kind of use case or this application? It, it seems like a tough problem uh, without having uh, somebody do that. Uh, driving, I mean, it's uh, it's more people like Bernard who are going to, you know, drive uh, drive discussions uh, in, in the B3C, and we'll try to. Uh, my role is to make sure that these discussions happen. That uh, yeah, uh, uh, we can. Uh, well, Francois has been very helpful right people. In, in identifying missing things. Right, I mean, one of the big issues is conversion between all these different APIs. Uh, I know you've been you found a bunch of and doing it with zero copies. That's that's the key. So I know you filed a bunch of bugs, Francois. We've uh, uh, UN Fable of Apple has been filing lots of bugs on WD streams and media processing. Um, but anyway, we should have a chat about how to how to have more highlight on this in, in TPAC. Just to add to the mess, uh, uh, one dimension that we didn't talk, mention is uh, media folks love uh, HDR content as well. And yes, uh, yes. right now the web is not really good at uh, HDR support. So you have another yeah. dimension there to add, which is extension to Canvas, extension to WebGPU, extension to uh, uh, ECMAScript actually, because even you, you need Float 16 array, uh, typed array as well. So um, another dimension uh, uh, that needs to be uh, addressed at the same time. Yeah. No, but I, I think it's great to have these experiments. They identify the pieces that are missing, and that's why they're so important. Okay. Uh, maybe uh, this is maybe a question for, for Jordi and Bernard more. If you put on your, your vendor hat, um, what, what is the uh, – I mean, are, are the browser you know, browser vendors involved here? Are the app vendors pushing this because they want this use case? Like what's the – can, can you speak a little bit? Like, what, what, what do you see? Well, I get what, a, like, why I, you do it, like, you know, ultimately, why are you driving this, right? Other than your, your interest in the standards bodies and you know, pushing things forward, but there's got to be well, a, an application because, that somebody wants to build. I mean, there, the, the input there, are, if all of this actually works, there's, uh, among other things, you get the, the kind of uh, scenarios that Jordy talked about, the low latency mm -hmm. streaming opens up. Um, but also, just even in, in conferencing, uh, you can do all the video processing that Francois has been talking about. You know, machine learning is a huge deal now and getting the performance you need out of it is not easy. Um, so, you know, people expect noise cancellation, all kinds of uh, video effects um, and getting all this done within that time window, particularly when you're moving to these new codecs like AV1 and HEVC, uh, it's pretty challenging. Um, so there's definitely, uh, there's definitely motivation, let me put it this way. Uh, yeah. But um, I think there's, my personal view is the connection between the developers and the feedback loop isn't as tight as it should be. Uh, I get, I listen to developers all day. I get a lot of complaints, um, but perhaps uh, not as many as I should get. Okay. Well, J Jordy, do you have any, uh, well, you gave a, a few complaints today, I guh you, you have any more for, uh, for, for Bernard and uh, for no, here? Like... I, I, will give, I will give those just, just, just those for now. That, more will come for sure. Uh, but but yeah, what, 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 I, what I see here is that I, I will be talking about more about um, media, media over quick. So if one of the a protocol like this is successful, so basically this protocol, the idea is to, it will cover a lot of use cases, starting, as Bernard mentioned, for video conferencing, live streaming, live streaming to masses, so one to one million, video conferencing one to one, and also inside side and player side. I think if, if it's successful, and, and I, I'm hoping it is successful, obviously, uh, it could be a huge simplification of the current, um, of, of the current um, uh, 
streaming, streaming in general uh, wall, having a single protocol that can cover all use cases that works on the on the CDN side, works on the player side, works on the MOQ. It's also developer developer efficiency. You don't need to learn WebRTC, RTMP, uh, SRT, and all of those things, and and then choose the one that fits your use case, and then do the conversion. So and and I hope to be honest, I really hope that MOQ is successful. Again, it's early stages. I think uh, now we have something almost ready for adoption, but it's not yet there. But definitely, I see if it's successful, it could be a, a huge help for the for the streaming world. Yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll simplify your life and protocols, Jordi, and make it more complicated in APIs. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, yeah, that's a, that's a way to see it. But let's hope that that APIs are good are better than the protocols. Then, yeah. <laughs> okay, let, let me uh, maybe let's transition some audience questions. So yeah, again, out in the audience, if you have questions, just uh, type them into the chat. I will read them off. Um, Jordy, you actually have a flight uh, you need to catch. Uh, I think in a few minutes, so we won't we won't keep you too long. Uh, I, I I still have a have a few times. So don't worry. Feel, okay, all right. Um, well, uh, the first question here um, from uh, Manish, and maybe this is a good one for you too, uh, Jordi. Is a uh, quick going to be available for RTP transmission? Uh, uh, you can. Okay, a quick has. Well, maybe may it'd be good for you to give. Uh, you did a little bit. Maybe give a little bit more overview of media over quick and what you're trying to do in that group too. Okay. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that's better because you can. So Quick is a reliable transmission. So you want to put a TMP. Uh, sorry, Quick Streams is a reliable. Uh, it's a reliable. It's like I don't like the comparison, but like TCP. Then you have also Quick uh, Datagrams that is unreliable. You can put RTP on top of that if you want. So I don't know if that answers the answers the question. Well, uh, uh, AVT Core is standardizing RTP over Quick. Um, oh, okay. I think. Okay. The, the, yeah, the major interest is in running RTP over quick, reliable streams in the frame per stream transport. Um, in my demo, I used RTP like framing, um, but it's something you'd have to do in your own app. Like you'd have to get an RTP stack in WebAssembly or something, and then you could transport it over Web Transport. So uh, I don't know of anybody actually doing this. Like there's no open source library I'm available, uh, but it can be done. And as we showed in these demos, it seems to work okay. All right, uh, next question from Dennis. In what scenario would tra web transport be better than peer connection? Um, web received live interaction conferencing over congested networks? And Bernard, you touched on this a little bit, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll let yeah, you know. Um, that, do that the, I don't know that I would uh, try it to do conferencing necessarily because that's where the, uh, the congestion control currently in web transport will not work well. It's It would be BBR v1 or v2. You'd really want something more like uh, Google... GCC, um, particularly with some, you know, with the large conferences we have today with, you know, seven by seven grids, 49 streams, um, that might be pretty tough with web transport with the congestion control that's implemented there. So this would not be the thing I would try first. I would probably uh, try the low latency streaming like what Jordan showed. Okay. Uh, I was a minute following up. Just wanted to know peer, peer connection will have a quick transport. Uh, so we have had some interest in a peer-to-peer -peer quick uh, methodology. Somebody mentioned that at the recent mock meeting. RTP over quick does run over a peer-to-peer -peer transport. Um, so I guess uh, I'm not a. We had an origin trial of, of quick transport a few years ago, uh, but went forward with client-server web transport. I guess the thing I'd say is if you really need this, uh, let us know. Um, it can be done. Um, I don't know how much demand there is for it, but we'll see. All right. Uh, Alvin had a question on. This is a always a question. What's Apple doing? Um, you know, I, I know they're not here, but uh, well, uh, Web Codex video is in Safari Preview, so you can play with that. It has AV1 support among other things. Uh, Web Transport, um, they they have uh, indicated they are interested in it, but it will not ship in 2023. Okay. All right. Uh, another one from Alvin. Any demo code for audio video sync? So yeah, yeah. yes. So uh, uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention that uh, all the all the demo or all the block diagrams that I showed is open source. So you can you can get that code, and that code does 
a relatively good job, I think, uh, aligning the audio and video. Again, a lot of hacks. I'm not happy about, with that code, but based on the constraints that I uh, mentioned, it's the best that I could come with, that I could come up. Yeah, uh, yeah and if, uh, I'll, I'll, if everyone just uh, if everyone wants to see those links now, you can just go to Weber C Hacks um, and check out the first the first post. There, I did just to uh, give some intro to this session and with a bunch of links. So, um, and I, I included your demo links in there and in your, your video demo too. Uh, thank you. All right. Uh, I don't see any other uh, audience questions for people in the audience. Here's your, your last chance. So, um, all right. If nothing else coming in, um, I, I do intend to uh, transcribe this interview, clean it up, and post it. Uh, the longer it goes on, the uh, the more work I have to do. So even though I have a lot of questions, I I, I might I might just stop it here. Uh, thank thank you all for uh, for joining. Um, I yeah, I find this very insightful. It's, it's interesting stuff. And future of WebRTC uh, or future of real time communications, I guess at, at least and, and beyond really uh in in progress so uh we got, we got some work to do still but that's exciting that you can you can see it it's going to happen um well it it, it, it looks it looks like it, at least it, it could happen right it, it looks very plausible if, if nothing else so uh thank you all have a uh i think it's uh well have a good flight back uh jordy and thank you I'll, thank you I'll see you all later all yeah, right thank thanks Right. Thanks a lot, Chad, for organizing Bye. and uh, Bernardo Francois. I learned a lot. Thanks. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thanks, please.